All right. All right. We are live. Hey, Athon fans and writers. Uh, we have an exciting interview today with Zogarth, and I've been loving his book, The Primal Hunter. And uh, so he's going to come up and talk with us a bit today, give us some advice and uh, give some of you new fans some insight into what his book's about and the world, amazing world he's built. Uh, but we're going to start today with a couple other books that are coming out today. First, we have Space Core. I uh, gotta be careful. I always look at it and think Corpse. Space Core by Ian Schwartz uh, in military sci fi. So I'm gonna do a brief synopsis on that. This is book one in a trilogy. Captured behind enemy lines to survive, he'll have to learn to fight by their rules. At first, it's a dream come true. Jonathan Blake, a young revolutionary hero, is assigned command of humanity's first FTL capable scout ship. But when the Space Corps um, mysteriously loses contact with an outpost beyond the solar system, the dream becomes a nightmare. His wife and his child are on that outpost. So uh, if you're into military sci-fi, Ian is a very talented writer, so go ahead and give that one a look. Next up, we have Shattered Throne, which is book five in Twilight of the God Chosen which there are seven books currently written for this one, on top of which is there's a God Chosen box set. So tons of books in this series by T.S. Snow. So a uh, quick look at book five. Arcanus is in civil war. The Margravine has been disposed. A plague rages. Sent by terraformation with vaccine to help the war-torn planet, Miles Sheffield is reunited with his best friend and his niece, offering the refugees asylum on Terra. All right, and then we have a box set, Outlaws of Aquila. Aquila, sorry if I uh, butcher the name of your book, <laughs> Cooper. MD Cooper has written this box set three in the series. And so within the L, a tri-star system located inside the Achillean Nebula, Jax ma makes a living trading and smuggling whatever goods pay the best. So far, he's avoided being caught with anything too damning in his ship's holds. But when he takes a job for Corinth, an infamous arms dealer, all that changes. The hull is worth 10 times his ship. And we, when the contents gets him embroiled in a tug of war between the major political factions of the L, Jax has to keep the criminals he works for from discovering that he's playing both sides. Hell, he just might have to play all the sides to navigate the tangled web he's in. So we got to always love having a box set out because uh, you have tons to read. And I know a lot of you like to plow through your books quickly. But today we have Zogarth with us to talk about Primal Hunter. Say hello to Zogarth in his currently polymorphed form. <laughs> what? Hey, this Zogarth. is in no way polymorphed. Oh, okay. In fact, I, I come from a prestigious family of politicians. <laughs> from all over the world. Uh, I just forgot my skin suit today. Uh, there you go. <laughs> uh, well, all hail our alien overlords as long as they provide us with meat and entertainment. And we have plenty of entertainment with the Primal Hunter. So tell us about this world that I have very much enjoyed enjoyed, uh, enjoyed reading over the, the past week. Uh, it's honestly, it's a very standard lit rpg and uh, in that like i pretty much i read a lot of other novels like the finds of the fall he would find with uh, he would fight mm -hmm. with monsters all of the big ones and i pretty much pick and chose what i wanted and then i made just a pretty yeah a standard universe where i took all of the good parts dungeons classes professions spent way too long waking and way too complicated system at least behind the hood. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I definitely felt some of that influence. I'm a big fan of Defiance of the Fall, and I felt a, a, I felt some some of the influence. But I mean, Lit RPG is is kind of making its own. As like it makes a groove. You you see some typical things. It's like a space opera. You, there's some certain elements that's going to happen in a space opera. Certain elements in a Lit RPG, and I think uh, I think you hit the vein. But then it it immediately and obviously has has taken its own awesome flavor and that is concentrating i feel on the hunter aspect so tell us about uh jake and his uh his love of hunting or or how he i think uh, you mentioned an out 
outside versus inside uh, motivation? Yeah, it's pretty much. I wanted to create a bit of a lighthearted story, and I also want a main character that. Yeah, I I want like a lot of levels. I want a main character that actually wants to get stronger, but at the same time, I didn't want what a lot of other novels do, which is pretty much like again uh, I mentioned before, defines of the fall. Yeah, defines of the fall is uh, pretty much sack in that his motivation to get stronger is always if i don't get stronger either i am fucked someone i like is fucked the entire world is fucked or just the entire situation he's in is fucked Mm -hmm. there's always some catastrophe waiting there's always a big villain around the corner waiting to destroy earth Mm -hmm. meanwhile in mine i didn't really want that but i still wanted the main characters who want to get stronger Mm-hmm. because we all want those levels we want the dopamine hits <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's true <laughs> but and the so you pretty much need a reason for him to get stronger and i just went with jake just wants to get stronger because he wants to kill big, bigger stuff yeah early on jake gets an ability that's very interesting a bloodline ability and um it's like it's like his instincts from his you know if you were to go back in DNA history genetically to the uh, the gather hunter gatherers, it's like that instinct wakes up in him, and everything it, it's perfect for him in this new world, and it gives him a huge leg up. I love that. It's very very unique, very original. I think all the lit RPG big authors have have looked around and seen different inspirations, and that's how we that's how the genre is created. I mean, we wouldn't have fantasy without looking at uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, and and taking what we like from it and creating our own new unique thing, and we've gotten some incredible pieces of art as a result of that. And so I think we're looking at um, we're looking at the the amalgamation of of these lit RPGs and making those paths to where uh, I want to read sci-fi, so I want those typical tri- sci-fi aspects with a whole new story. This this hits all the the nails on the head. Um, I, I love how. At the, he, he takes his time in some ways to, to do what he wants to do, but you get into some stuff that it hasn't been ventured too deeply into, like the, the alchemy side of things, the rarity of uh, potions, um, the fact that he starts with a group and immediately he's thinking, you know what, I'm better on my own. And he goes on his own, not in a callous way, but in a this is just better for everyone. And so there's a lot of aspects of that I like. Um, and I've very much been enjoying it. So I uh, highly recommend it. Everyone that's watching this has probably seen some aspects of Primal Hunter, but if you haven't started reading this one, put it on your list and get it today or uh, get it very soon because uh, this is a good one to follow. So uh, as far as aspiring authors and writers, um, you, you must have um, quite a few good tips for them. What, what would you yeah. say is for the, the key figures? Uh, honestly, yeah. like... It's actually a bit, as you say, with the like Jake and mine. I think a lot of it's always different. Like I think it's important to quickly establish that the main character has something interesting about him. Mm-hmm. Because in the Primal Hunter, I chose to go with the bloodline and especially like get it very early in there, because it's pretty much the kind of power that will allow him to grow, and that is like instantly recognized. Oh. He's like a special character in the world. Like he has something outstanding about him. Because I'm go- I'm going to be honest. A lot of people say that they don't like like uh, Mary Sue's and they don't like like overpowered characters. But I'm going to be mm-hmm. honest. If you have a multiverse with like trillions of people in it, how the fuck is the main character going to stand a chance if he ain't an overpowered Mary Sue? Yeah. Like that's uh, because. He's gonna, the people that he eventually has to compete against are also overpowered. Gary Stu, so I don't remember what the male term is. Yeah. And so I think that's important for a lot to get it early in there because mm-hmm. a lot of like start with a novel and they're like, oh, this is the same thing I've already read five times, potentially even better in other novels. So I wanted to instantly get mine in there again. I already did a great by just giving my main character a bow instead of an axe or sword. Mm-hmm. Instantly, we already differentiated from all the other novels. 
You got a more oh, Robin Hood show. I love that cover. That cover is absolutely gorgeous. Um, and I, at first I didn't know, I was like, what's he about to fight a snake that's the size of a country? But no, uh, you find out there about a, qu a quarter of the way through, I, f I find out what it is. And, and you know, it, it, it is that that cover kind of gives that hovering. It's like there's this thing that's uh, overshadowing, like uh, looking behind. There's a power out there and uh, there's a bigger universe out there. And so love that. Love that cover. Um, so Defines of the Fall and all these ones, um, they do have that. They do have some of that bigger inspiration for these series. But once again, this if you're a fan of Defiance of the Fall, you're going to be a fan of the Primal Hunter. But it is a completely different beast altogether. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, like, I, I, again, I think a lot of it is, again, like Defiance of the Fall always feels like a constant roller coaster of tension. Like oh, there's yeah. always something happening. There's always it. a threat. There's <laughs> always something to fight. And yeah, I, like I personally love it, but... I do think it like, for example, in mine, I also want to have the quiet moments, like, as you said before, alchemy. Mm -hmm. In I honestly couldn't imagine like Zack in Defiance of the Fall decide to sit down for 10 years and, hey, I'm going to do some fun alchemy. Because by the time he exits his cave, his entire country is going to be gone because some random cultivator went by and went, went oh, I want to destroy this. <laughs> but in Primal Hunter, it's like, he can disappear for a few years and I'm sure people are probably going to ask where he is, but man, yeah. it's Jake. He, he just does whatever he wants to. Um, yep. So we'll go to the comments section here. Uh, so if y'all have a question for Zogarth, go for it. And unless you want to you see his flesh mask, which he left behind, unfortunately, um, just praise your overlord accordingly. But uh, as soon as we started Zoggers, Zoggers, what does Zoggers mean? Do you know? <laughs> oh, that is uh, when I began a Discord. I pretty much uh, I chose uh, like a random mod, and he uploaded. Uh, I don't know if you know Twitch chat Pogos, mm -hmm. which is like just a frog, like uh, with its mouth open, like hype, super heavy, and he just took a picture of a snake and made the same thing, but with a snake, and then it's just called Sarkas <laughs> in my Discord. Let's see. We got um, High Angus. Primal Hunter is a lot more Western than the Eastern influence Defiance of the Fall. And it's greatly appreciated. Yeah, I I think I said earlier that sort of the, the Robin Hood vibe you got going here. And uh, um, uh, yeah, ex like except he, he takes from the rich and keeps everything. <laughs> of course, of course. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Questions. Questions. Um, Let's see. Agreed. Jake is more active than passive. Stuff happens to him, of course, but he goes and seeks out challenges on his own, more shapes his own destiny. Uh, <laughs> Eric, John, watch out. You think you're interviewing Zogarth, but there's two more of them in the bushes on each side of you. I like it. Uh, all right. So how will you manage not having Jake feel overshadowed and or powered by the Nabruo clan progenitor? Feel <laughs> overshadowed. Uh, Honestly, like if we go by like influence and stuff on earth, like I think I've said on Discord before, but and also kind of written that Jake doesn't really care about earth, like as a planet, it's just a piece mm -hmm. of rock. So, like, if it's, like, with influence, and if you, like, not feel over shower, it's less powered by uh, the Nobu clan, no uh, progenitor, like, Jake is going to keep getting stronger. Uh, the guy he mentions, it's a bit of a spoiler for, I guess, yeah, that would be book six, or so book five, <laughs> where they have the big uh, showdown. So, uh, I think it's a bit too spoilerish. Uh, like, yeah, people will see the character for the first time book two. So... Yeah. Yeah, it, but yeah, that's like uh, another human that he would like to like compete with. Uh, it's already given me, you know, post post traumatic stress from my interview uh, talking about <laughs> Ghost Town. He's he's like, oh, it's gonna be a twenty twenty two book series. <laughs> and I'm like, what? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Don't worry, uh, I'm gonna beat it. I better I'm gonna beat it. Better keep my job, or I won't be able to, you know, send my kids to college with how many books I'm gonna have to buy. <laughs> so. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, 
uh, could I request to have whale banned from the chat? He used, <laughs> he used a bad word. Uh, of course. Uh, is um, let's see. Is the whole story planned already, or is it more open ended at the moment? I guess that's a that's a writer style uh, that that we haven't gotten into very much. The pre planned yeah, uh, it, it writes itself. So I'm gonna be honest. My way of writing is probably a bit weird. Like uh, I don't really. I plan. I plan moments, but I don't really plan arcs. Like. I think a way of thinking about like a lot of people know Dragon Ball. What I do is I plan Goku going Super Saiyan versus Frieza and having an epic showdown. And then I plan the entire Namek arc before that, like after that. Mm -hmm. I have, all right, I want this epic showdown, this epic fight between these two characters. How the hell do I get there? And that's, uh, I know it's probably like, that's probably a lot of professional writers saying, oh no, that's a really bad thing. You're not allowed to do that. But honestly, I think it works for me. Like yeah. I had, uh, there are like uh, the entire, uh, I think in book, again, in book one, I have uh, some things. It's mainly actually setting up a lot of the great things for book two that then come. Oh, I've yeah. said it before, but uh, the entire first arc is ends uh, like uh, around halfway through book two, a bit more than halfway through book two. I originally wanted this like as like one book, but Red is like, oh no, you can't have a fourteen hundred page book. That's too long. We can't make paperbacks. <laughs> too long audio book. Can't be forty hours. Yeah, Red, stop your complaining. <laughs> no. no. Uh... No, Rhett, Rhett's, a, Rhett's a genius, and he's done a great job pulling together uh, these talented authors and helping y'all, you know, helping y'all enter the, enter the, I mean, the big world where so much more exposure, so many fans can can be, I mean, because I'd never heard of Royal Road before I started working for Athon, and so I wouldn't get to enjoy all this stuff. I literally have become a lit RPG file because... I found out that, you know, all these authors coming out and uh, found that vein of, because I used to read like uh, the, the web novels and the mangas in, in that, you know, Esekai kind of world, but I'd never seen a, a little yeah, I, novel. I, 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 I think that's very n normal. Like, I think the pipeline pretty much goes, uh, people start to read like Japanese novels and uh, mm -hmm. Korean novels. Then they begin yeah. to read Chinese novels. When then when they're done with the Chinese novels, they begin to read the original English novels. Mm -hmm. And they, then when they are too much caught into those, they begin like actually paying for books. Yeah. The first one <laughs> the first one was the gamer, uh, where a guy just wakes up with video game powers. And oh, yeah, uh, the web it. novel. Yeah, he's he's just sitting in his class and he goes inventory and he puts a pencil in and he goes whoa. It's <laughs> like that was so much fun. Uh, that's what started me down this uh, this this path of you know spending way too much time <laughs> reading the RPG novels. All right, so a couple more questions. Um, Zogarth, you've been asked to become a dinosaur VTuber. Uh, let's see. Here's a question: Will there be a love interest for Jake? And is your hand feeling better? Uh, yeah, I love interest. Who knows? Uh, I think there's been a couple of questions about your hand. Uh, and yeah, yeah. Uh, well, it's not my hand, it's my wrist. And yeah, it's doing better. That's good. That's good. Of you course, be... uh, now people are being assholes and forcing me to write free bonus chapters because my book reads like top 100 on Audible <laughs> and I promise free uh, bonus chapters. Oh, goodness. Uh, let's see. What's it like writing morally gray characters like the merchant guy and the rapidly humanizing William, uh, psycho metal guy? Uh, yeah, William was extremely interesting to me and unique. The morally gray characters. I don't um, think interesting is the word they used on Royal Road originally. Was Holy that? shit. The people people do not like William like anywhere. No. I, it, it's... it's in the start, it was a bit distressing, but now it's just entertaining. I know whenever I publish any chapter with William in it, I'm going to get like 50 comments that are like, oh, no, why William? Why isn't he dead oh, yeah. yet? Remove him. I, like, I, I, the entire novel. 
I hate William and that's an excuse for you to keep him, not to get rid of him. <laughs> it's like, yeah. uh, you, uh, you gotta but, have, uh, you, you misunderstand. Have People do not understand that a character can be written to be hateable. Yes. If you, it's, uh, it's like an acting. Um, I mean, the, 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 the evil, I can't think of the name right now because I'm, I'm blanking. I'm in an interview, you know, um, the Royal road, the little kid King that, uh, everyone hated. <sighs> Why can't I think of his name? Anyway, uh, King Joffrey. Yeah, King Joffrey. Um, the director comes to him and says, "Congratulations, everyone hates you. Good job." And yeah, but like... <laughs> but at the same time, he also got like dozens of death threats every single day <laughs> while being well, the actor. So yeah, it's well, like... you should just publish <laughs> William's address. That way, everyone can send their hate oh yeah, William. <laughs> well, Them to be fair, realizing... with the way he's written, he's probably going to kill everyone that tries. Oh goodness. Um... Yeah, but, but yeah, like have... mor morally great characters. I think it's just like writing a character because I'm gonna be honest, most people aren't like morally just or morally like unjust. People are just people, they have their own motivations, their own history, their own culture. So, uh, what may be fucked up to you may not be fucked up to another. I think mm -hmm. I often I talk to another author. Which actually said something interesting. He's from India, like rural India. And he talked about something he found was interesting. Was that often arranged marriage, like in a lot of novels, like Chinese novels, also Western ones, is often like, oh, that's a bad thing. Like uh, the female like is uh, forced into an arranged marriage. A guy is forced into an arranged marriage. And it's often like it's always viewed as a negative thing. Mm -hmm. To him, he thought that was weird. Because in his life, in his worldview, in his culture, arranged marriage was just good. Like a marriage yeah. was just like, it was like a business contract between two families, between two people that, all right, we now have combined finances and like we are going to create a strong family unit. Yeah. All that stupid stuff about love and actually caring about each other, that's something that comes later when you are already married. As, as he said, the, what's the difference between arranged marriage, which is two families vetting the two people, getting to know each other, figuring out if you're compatible between people who sign up to a dating website and spend a lot of money for it to tell you who you're compatible with. Yeah. And, and I often think about that and it's a surprisingly good point. That, it is uh, good of point. course, it, it matters between people. To him, like, he always found it weird. He never liked when he read a novel and it's like, it uh, said an arranged marriage and his first reaction was like, oh, all right, yeah, yeah, that sounds nice. Oh, that sounds nice. Ones. And then, then, then they're like, and this is how we're going to stop. And he's like, wait, why? Yeah, it's it's funny because uh, I'm, I've been married now for get close to eight years and uh, I, can, I can see the values of an arranged marriage, not because of the difficulties of my marriage, but because of, the way we dated, I um, got a good piece of advice and they said, as much as you can while you're dating, get in front of her friends and your friends and her family and your family and be together in your dating atmosphere as much as possible That's because you can't hide who you truly are in front of your friends and family. And uh, there's you're only showing your best foot, but if your parents are involved and they, they know your personality type and they're seeing the other person, they're literally vetting for you. So they're increasing your chances for success. So I've actually heard a lot of people recently talking about this. I wish we would go back to arranged marriages. <laughs> so, but yeah, your initial point there is you're having to see from other people's point of view. Whereas William did this horrible crime in some parts of history. This was a normal thing that he did. I'm not going to spoil it for you. It's going to make you hate him, what William did in his past. But um, this horrible crime from a certain point of view, from a certain mindset, from certain cultures, it was actually a, a very normal, disgusting, if you believe in the sanctity of human life. But, um, but yeah, it's horrible. And, it, and, but that's what you have to have those evil people, those protagonists, those people that make you chilled because you have that, that you have to have that, uh, contrast with your main character. So, uh, let's see any more questions we got here. Um, other people that say they they think William is a very ex interesting character. Um, let's see. Ba, ba, ba. More talking about William. With uh, will will we see Jake? Uh, will we see Jake interacting with higher tier beings anytime soon? It's one of 
It's one of their favorite things. So I I thought it was interesting when he first met his patron um, and he ends up consulting, consult, you know, counseling a God. But um, what, at what point are we going to see those higher tier uh, in, interactions? Uh, a bit throughout, but uh, like in the current arc on Patreon, there's a lot of it. <laughs> like yeah. it's uh, not to spoil, but uh, I'm going to tease something. I think sometimes in book two that actually comes true. A lot of people thought it was just a joke, but yeah, he's going to like uh, actually go to the order and stuff and actually meet people there. Yeah. And of course, a lot of those are uh, a, lo- a lot stronger than Jake is on every level. Very good. Yeah. Um, it's, it's that tension really ramps up when they're around higher tier beings and they're having to basically, the, I'm the main character, but I have to depend on the, uh, the fancies of this thing that I'm in the same room with. Um, yeah. And that's also something that I kind of wanted to have, like that Jake doesn't really care because he also has like the weird mindset that, uh, it's pretty normal for humans that, of course, uh, they don't want to, like, they don't want to die. Yeah. And Jake kind of has that, well, if it happens, it happens. He's yeah. like, he thought, he think it would be annoying. He, do, he doesn't want to die. But if he gets killed, he's pretty much like, well, that was probably my own fault. I guess I'm yeah. dead now. <laughs> so, like, he has a very casual approach to life and that also extends to like how he thinks about others and like how they think about him that he thinks it's totally fair to like fight someone to the death and if he kills them like that's a fair fight if they kill him that would be totally fair he wouldn't like hold it against someone if they killed him yeah he it isn't it is changing the dynamic him going into certain scenarios with that mindset and it's uh it's prevalent and and well described in the book uh before uh, his his mindset on certain scenarios so uh, it's it's great it's it's well written parts um question why does why do uh why does a velociraptor need glasses i thought their eyesight was supposed to be very good <laughs> uh, they are mostly cosmetic you know oh. you know a lot of people just buy rims for glasses without any actual glass in it it's <laughs> yes. a fashion statement look at it the mustache isn't even truly attached to my chin uh, yeah. Also a fashion statement. Yes. Well, uh, we'll, we'll look for your, some fashion updates in the next interview. All right. A couple more questions and then we'll wrap it up. Um, what role is Mira going to have? See, that's again, people that uh, talk about uh, Patreon spoilers and like uh, spoilers for many books later. Yeah. Uh, uh, but the role she's playing is that she's a character. A main point of so, view. Yes. No, so, not not really. Like no, just, no. she's just a character. People will yeah. find out eventually. Yeah. Um, let's see. Is there any plan? Uh, there's people asking about side stories, but uh, I'll, I'm going to change that question up a little bit. Is there any plan to uh, publish side stories? Uh, yeah, a bit. Uh, in book two, I have. Uh, it's actually it uh, harkens back a bit to Royal Road when I initially launched. I in the first arc I have a lot more POVs of other characters than like in prior in the later stages, okay. like a lot more points of view. In the first one we have uh, Jacob and we have William and we have Richard. Like we have a lot of characters that we all get points of view from, and I kind of learned pretty early on that people don't really like that. At least not too much of it. Yeah. So when I was publishing the first arc, I had some chapters that I pretty much cut out and made into side stories because they were like, I rewrote them a bit, but they were kind of important to the story, but not really vital to the story. Like what happened to them could be explained in a few sentences, Mm -hmm. but uh, they were like the POV of like another character. So I pretty much removed those and I made them into side, uh, into side stories. But when going through like book two and like, uh, the things for book two, I was pretty much like, yeah, I want to, I want to include them, like a few of the side stories. So I have two of the like 
right now only the only on Patreon right now, but like two side stories will be part of like the book too. So the first you, one yeah. is uh, like a POV from the Patreon garden, like his order, like his cult. And then the second one is uh, about uh, the character Casper. Like uh, what happens to him? Oh yeah, gosh. Yeah, uh, yeah. Like uh, uh, I, I literally, I mean, I started your book late last week, and it's such a long book that I'm, I'm not through it. So you get a lot for your credit if you're doing Audible for sure, uh, and then you're getting a lot of book for your buck. So if you're if you haven't bought it yet and you're wondering what the heck we're talking about, go get it. Um, but uh, what happened with Casper was completely unexpected. <laughs> so uh, that just happened a couple chapters back when I was listening through the audiobook. So. Yeah. I had a lot going on, like the first arc. It was very experimental writing. Like I began the, I've said that I've like told this before, but when I began publishing my book, I already had uh, around 160 chapters written. Like yeah. I had 160 chapters written before a second person even had ever read a single word of the story. Oh, wow. And, like, I never really talked about it with anyone. So when I put it up on Royal Road, the first person to, like, click my chapter one was the second ever person to read anything of the story. Wow. I never had anyone else in there. So, like, I read it all for myself because I was bored and couldn't find a job after university <laughs> for a while. And uh, then I just continued writing while I worked, like, to relieve stress and stuff. So it was very much just me writing it. And I have, the last time I read that I wrote anything fiction was, I think, in ninth grade when I was 15 or 16. <laughs> so like over 10 years ago. But, well, it did kind of help to write 160 chapters and then go back to chapter one and be like, holy shit, that was bad. <laughs> and then to go through it again and like edit it a few times before I put it out. But even oh. then, I think like the latest book and the first book, like there's a big difference, like I think in quality and also like really finding the stride, hmm. which is also why I think that the first arc has some, well, it has a lot of interesting ideas, but maybe too many ideas at hmm. some points. So the, the act of refining it after you, it's kind of nice that you get to go the, refined it in a, in a couple of waves but um uh the last question i'm gonna i'm gonna end with as uh did you ever imagine that it would be this successful uh that you that this story would be so appreciated and uh that uh you know the kid who couldn't find a job after college was actually working on on some something incredible in a career uh well, no, like I think most people who uh, like begin writing a novel has like it looked unpopular this week of Royal Road and like clicked on Defiance of the Fall or He Who Fights with Monsters or Esper and Feel or like any of the big ones and like uh, clicked on that page and be like, oh, damn, they're actually earning a lot of money. But I don't think anyone in the right mind like looks and then be like, damn. I'm just going to do that. That's going to be so easy. I'm just going to write my own novel and publish that. I'm going to be honest. When I like wrote my novel and when I began, I, be, I began throwing it up because at my job, I just gotten a, like, a big promotion at my job. And then the very same day, I, like, re, I like, signed the contract. Everything was settled and done. I went home and I was like, all right. I won't have uh, say, as much time to write anymore. So I just took it and just threw it onto a uh, Royal Road. And I was like, yep, that's now we just like schedule a bunch of chapters, just begin to toss them up there and like focus on my job. Because I pretty much thought, yeah, like a dozen people are going to read it. And uh, then I don't feel like I wasted the time because maybe someone will enjoy it. <laughs> and that then ended up with me like going to my boss like one and a half months later being like, so. According to the contract, I have to inform you if I like get a second job. And uh, considering I now have to make a company to file for tax purposes, I kind of got a second job now, I guess. <laughs> uh, so, well. yeah. So I ended up like 
quitting my job, still stayed on hourly for a few months, like to help transition and stuff. And then I began writing full time, and then it's been going uh, well since then. Well, congratulations. Hopefully even, even better now, as I'm actually a real author. Yeah, congratulations. We're, we really appreciate that the fact that uh, you've gotten these opportunities to share this story with us, and uh, I'm sure everyone here is very glad that you just decided to throw it up on Royal Road and see if anyone liked it, because we all did. So good job. Congratulations. Very excited for the future. Very excited to see the next and the next and the next release. The your, the audiobook talent did a wonderful job on the audiobook. And so every time that comes up, I'm snatching one up. So if you're uh, if you've watched through the interview this long, I'm assuming you've already read some parts of Primal Hunter. But if you haven't, please go ahead and purchase one and give it a try and send it to your friends. If you are a fan of Blue RPG uh, or any of the big names in Lit RPG, you, you're definitely, Zogarth is a name to know and uh, pick pick the book up. So we will hopefully have you again in the future at another release, do an interview for us. And um, maybe you'll have your skin suit. Maybe you'll have a new pair of spectacles to show off <laughs> to the to the group. But uh, we are very thankful that you took the time today to talk with us. And uh, we will see you at the next interview. So Goodbye. See you all next week, everyone.